So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Sam Tan as our guest speaker for our 27th annual general meeting. Thank you, Sam. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I was not here at this meeting last year, uh, which was just a couple of days after the death of our beloved uh, Queen. Uh, but I want to tell you how what happened on that day where I heard the news. In fact, I was in Avignon in the south of France with a tour group, a uh, church group going to the Obrama Gar Passion Play, and we went through rural France on the way. And on that tour was a bloke from Sydney who, if you can believe it, was even more of a royalist than I am, and he was keeping on the, the news feeds on his phone. We just arrived in Avignon, we were at the hotel, uh, and we were walking out to dinner, and he came and said to me, the word had just come through that the Majesty has passed away. So we were in this restaurant, our group made up about a third of the restaurant uh, in France, obviously, the French people there, and uh, I made the announcement to the tour group, and uh, I led us in prayer, and we raised a glass to speed Her Majesty's heavenly journey, and then we stood and sang with great gusto, God save the King, and all the French people wondered what on earth had happened. But the rest of the, the rest of the rest of them could not believe what was going on. Uh, all of these Aussies, I think we might have had two Kiwis on the tour, but the rest of it just were Australians. Uh, what has the correlation to do with us? On May 6th, while our avowed Republican Prime Minister sat in Westminster Abbey, swearing his allegiance to King Charles III. The hypocrisy is breathtaking, isn't it? I, an avowed constitutional monarchist, stood in the drizzle with half a million others watching the coach go by. Well, it had its moments. Just in front of me were about a dozen yobbos with placards declaring, not my king. One of them about my age had a Southern Cross Eureka flag and a boxing kangaroo flag. So his national identity was fairly obvious. He couldn't bring himself to carry the Australian flag, so I waved my flag in his face as, uh, as much as I could. As the Royal Coach came within about 100 metres, several London bobbies, policemen, hoisted above their heads a huge Union Jack banner about from here to the fringe long and completely blotted out, obliterated our view of the coach, but more importantly, obliterated the king and queen's view of the protesters. I thought that was just so cool. <laughs> I proceeded to engage the yobbo who was demonstrating with the Australian boxing kangaroo uh, from Melbourne, predictably. I lived there for 10 years, I can say. I engaged him in what my wife calls a full and frank exchange of views. Terry and I don't argue, we just have a full and frank exchange of views. <laughs> what relevance does it all have for us today, he said. We've been managing ourselves for 200 years. Why do we need the English to tell us what to do? The Queen I could barely tolerate, but not this idiot. Sadly, I thought the Republican debate in Australia focuses too much on personalities. Everybody loved the late Queen for her commitment to duty. Harry and Meghan are on the nose. The jury of public opinion is still out on King Charles III. Now that Her Late Majesty has gone to a heavenly reward, it's time for Australia to become a republic. I read almost every other day in some news feed. I hear that sentiment expressed. My Aussie mate in the crowd didn't express it so eloquently. He was a bit more rude about the English and the King. So, I said to him, having lived in Melbourne, I could say, so that's what the chattering classes are saying over there, decaffeinated cafe macchiatos in Carlton and Fitzroy, is it? The debate must not be about personalities. Any constitutional debate must focus on the system. So, I said to him, which country's model of republic would you like? Iran? North Korea? Zimbabwe? You won't believe his reply. What's wrong with Sweden, he asked. Duh, as my kids would say, duh, mate, Sweden is a constitutional monarchy. 
Mayor King is sitting inside the attic today. I sincerely hope to score a better seat than that Republican Prime Minister. Well, America, he offered. America, I stammered in disbelief. America, where Nancy Pelosi could honestly say, the people elected us, the Democratic Party, to run the country by giving us a majority in the Congress. Donald Trump, on the other hand, could equally honestly say, au contraire, monsieur, I'm not sure if he say that, but he could equally honestly say, the American people elected me, a Republican, to run the country. A broken system, the Republic of the United States. You look about my age, I said to him. You will remember 1975. How do you think, this is my old mate still in London, how do you think the Whitlam saga would have ended under the American system of government? I guess in civil war. They really had a civil war on the day of President Biden's inauguration. Yes. He held a string of abuse at me, cursing Sir John Kerr and me as pompous gifts and stalled off. That was the end of our full and frank exchange of views. <laughs> The drizzle was getting heavier, so I headed for the tube to get back to my hotel. 1975, and I went to watch the coronation on television. In 1975, in Australia, it might well have ended in civil war. Last September, when I was in Europe, the United Kingdom had, within that one calendar month, September 2022, it had two monarchs, and three prime ministers, you will remember. Yeah. Boris, <laughs> Liz, Liz Truss, mm -hmm. and uh, Liz Lacoria. Two monarchs and three prime ministers, all with one calendar, within calendar one. The transition of power was smooth mm -hmm. and without incident. Constitutional monarchy. Mm -hmm. I cannot envisage I cannot envisage that happening in many of the world's republics without civil war. Yeah. Constitutional monarchy works and it has delivered for the United Kingdom and for Australia. We have a truly unique system of government where our Governor General is appointed by the leader of the democratically elected government of the day. To be a referee above the party political system with the task of supervising the smooth running of democracy. If there is a deadlock between the two Houses of Parliament, the Governor General has the specific task under Article 57 of the Australian Constitution to step in and resolve the deadlock by dissolving Parliament and calling fresh elections. A duty as required by the Constitution. Only once in our 122 year history of the Federation of Australia has this been required. In November 1975, the House of Representatives was controlled by one party. The Senate was controlled by another party. The Senate exercised its constitutional right to reject legislation passed by the House of Representatives. There was a deadlock. So the Governor General, Sir John Kerr, acted as required by the Constitution in such circumstances, dissolved the Parliament immediately calling fresh elections. The Australian Republicans and the left generally have despised and demonised Sir John Kerr ever since. What did he do? Give his duty. How might November 1975 have ended in the great republics of the world? We don't need to worry about that because we have someone above politics, our referee in Australia's constitutional monarchy. Constitutional monarchy, a monarch or the monarch's representatives chosen by the elected government of the day in Australia, how can you get more democratic than that? The monarch's representative and the elected parliament working together, a brilliant sharing of power with checks and balances. A governor general in an emergency situation can and is constitutionally required to dissolve parliament and call fresh elections. A parliament in emergency, a parliament, the elected parliament in an emergency can sack a king, and they've done it twice. 1688, the Parliament told King, told king James II that he didn't fit the dual description for the King of England. His Catholicism took him too close to England's eternal enemy, France. Again in 1938, the 
Parliament, well, King Edward VIII, but there was a job description for the King of England and the Supreme Governor of the Church of England, and he didn't fit the job description. The, all the Dominion Prime Ministers were consulted, by the way. Where might we be if Edward VIII had continued as King? No George VI, no Elizabeth II. You might call Elizabeth the Great. Back at the hotel now, the rain is getting heavy. A travel companion who had watched it so far on TV, not that the bloke, the weather didn't improve, uh, he said to me, don't you think it's all a bit medieval, a bit born to rule, this absolute monarch stuff, wasn't it? Referring to the ceremony itself. Bits of it were, but the BBC commentators explained it all as we went along. <laughs> I am so sad that I missed the ABC coverage with Stan Grant's commentary. <laughs> Not. Not. <laughs> Not. The coronation took place in the Abbey, a Christian church, and it was, unashamedly, a Christian celebration. The monarch is, after all, the supreme governor of the Church of England. Born to rule? No. Born to serve. As Prince of Wales, King Charles's motto emblazoned under the Prince of Wales feathers was Ich die German, I serve. The coronation service began with the welcome from that 14 year old boy, wasn't it lovely? King Charles responded, in Jesus' name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. The Archbishop welcomed everyone with the greeting. We gather to give thanks for the King's life of service to this nation. Service. Not born to rule, born to serve. Then followed the 1,600-year-old Christian hymn known to every Christian from the Holy Communion service or the Mass, the Catholics, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Sung this time in Welsh, for one who had been the Prince of Wales for well over 50 years. Then the coronation unfolded. Five main steps. Firstly, the recognition. The recognition right dates back to the ancient procedures of the Witan, the Supreme Council of England in Anglo-Saxon times. A thousand years before the absolute monarch King uh, Louis XVI of France was overthrown for being a dictator. 1100 years before Tsar Nicholas II of Russia was overthrown by his people for being an absolute dictator monarch, England had a parliament in embryo, the Witan dating from the 800s, the 800s. Footnote, the dictator Napoleon who followed in France and the dictator who followed, the dictator Stalin who followed in Russia might have given cause for the people to wonder whether they'd done the right thing in getting rid of their dictator monarch. Representatives of the people say in the in the service, I here present unto you King Charles, your undoubted king. Wherefore, all of you who are come this day to do your homage and service, are you willing to do the same? And the congregation and choir replies, God save King Charles. The people welcome the king. His authority derives from the love in which he is held, not uh, the, the uh, uh, love in which he is held because of the service which he does. That's why he's accepted by the people in that service. The king was presented with a Bible by the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. I digress. John, you've heard this before when you came to some service. The royal tour of 1952, abandoned with the death of King George VI when the return to London of the Princess Elizabeth from Kenya, you will recall, they, on that tour, they were scheduled to visit Australia after Kenya, beginning in Fremantle on the 1st of March, concluding in Council on the 1st of May, 1952. It was to include a visit to Toowoomba, with Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh scheduled to attend worship at St. Stephen's then Presbyterian Church in Toowoomba, right up to the Empire Theatre, on Sunday, April 27th, at the 11 a.m. service. We know it now as St. Stephen's United Church, where my family worships and we are on our trip to. We all know that the Queen is the Supreme Head of the Church of England, so what was she doing planning to worship in a Presbyterian church in Toowoomba? Mm -hmm. Common knowledge hadn't. 
First appearance is the Church of Scotland, I'm sure you like that. Common knowledge has it that Her Majesty is the head of the Church of England and also the head of the Church of Scotland, the mother church of Presbyterians throughout the world. The trouble with common knowledge is that it, while, while it may be common, it ain't always knowledge. <laughs> In fact, her queen is not the head of the Church of Scotland. The Church of Scotland asserts, uh, as does the United Church, that it has no head other than Jesus. It is true that Her Majesty is a member of the Church of Scotland and attends Church of Scotland church services uh, when in Scotland. Presbyterian services. So Her Majesty is an Anglican until she crosses the Queen River uh, and then she becomes a Presbyterian to Protestant churches. No cognitive dissonance here. I lived and worked in the United Kingdom in the 1980s where I reverted to being a Methodist, the church of my childhood. When I'm in America for any length of time, I'm a United Methodist. In Australia, I'm a United Church man, whatever you have an adjective. Only on only at Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953, and at her insistence, was the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland included in the service. The second step was the Pope. The coronation oath of 1688 requires the king to declare during his crowning ceremony that he will maintain the established Anglican Church, rule according to laws agreed in Parliament, and cause law, justice, and mercy to be executed in his judgment. For the first time at King Charles III's coronation, there was a preface to the coronation oath in which the Archbishop says the Church of England will seek to foster an environment where people of all faiths and beliefs may live freely. The epistle lesson was read by the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, a practicing Hindu. No problem. After the sermon, no escaping the sermon, Anglicans are still Protestant enough for that, <laughs> no escaping the sermon, the ancient hymn, Veni Creator, was sung in the four languages of the United Kingdom. English, Welsh, Scottish, Gaelic, and Irish Gaelic. The next step was the anointing. The anointing with holy oil is the central act of the religious ceremony that takes place in Christ. It harkens back to the Kingdom of Israel, 1000 BC. Handel's sublime music echoes down the centuries. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon the king and all the people rejoiced. Then came the investiture and crowning. Having been sanctified of his anointing, the king is prepared to be crowned with the presentation of symbols, spurs, horn, sword, ring, glove, all symbols of service, not of power. Not born to rule, born to serve. The archbishop puts the crown on the king's head with a prayer and the declaration, God save the king. And all the people, except my old mate in the crowd, except perhaps our Republican Prime Minister, respond, God save the King. Compare that with the Republican Napoleon Bonaparte, who seized the crown out of the Pope's hands and crowned himself. False modesty was never a problem for old Napoleon Bonaparte, was it? Then comes the enthronement and the homage. The enthroning is the setting of the King in his crown on the throne and it traditionally represents the monarch taking possession of his kingdom. The Church of England pays homage, then the new Prince of Wales, the next in line to the throne, and then the people pay homage. The Archbishop said, I call upon all persons of goodwill in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and all of the other realms and the territories to make their homage in heart and voice to their undoubted King, Defender of all. The Archbishop of Canterbury proclaims, God save the King, with the people replying, God save King Charles. Long live King Charles, may the King live forever. From room 814 in the Tower of Popcorn Hotel at Kensington High Street, my shout, shout could be heard all along the corridor. It was raining quite heavily at the moment. <laughs> then the Lord's Prayer, the Holy Communion for the new King and Queen. <clears throat> Not a grasping of power, but a statement of service, not born to rule, but born to serve. Is that how Stalin came to power? Or Hitler? Or let's be honest here. 
Is that how Malcolm Turnbull became Prime Minister? Is that how Julie Gillard became Prime Minister? <laughs> At pre-dinner drinks, champagne for me, one of my tour group trotted out the tired old racist xenophobic Republican lie, why do we need a foreign head of state? No doubt he was one of those amongst the chattering classes who would castigate me for using the term foreigner in our all-welcome and inclusive country. Here's the point. The Australian Constitution does not use the term head of state. We don't have one. We don't have a Robert Mugabe or an Ayatollah Khomeini or an Idi Amin. We are happy to leave that nonsense to the republics. Under our unique and precious constitution, our democratically elected parliaments appoint a referee to sort out problems should they arise. The Governor General is as close as we get to a head of state. In a system which we inherited from Britain, along with our laws, our legal system, and our beautiful language. Let's not tamper with our constitution. God save the king. <laughs>